here in the second day of the event at Harvard Medical School. I'm so excited. I got to talk to rheumatologists who practice at Massachusetts General Hospital, Brigham and Women's, Johns Hopkins, and I was able to ask them some of the questions that you prednisone warriors asked me in the survey. I got over 250 responses to the survey, and I felt like one of the most important questions people asked, one of the most heartfelt, painful unanswered questions were all about the same. I got many of variations of this question. I'm just going to read this one. How do you tell the difference between pain from coming off prednisone and pain from polymyalgia rheumatica? When you come off prednisone, it's not clear if it's still PMR pain. The PMR pain was worse when I first started and prednisone helped, but when I taper down, the pain comes back. Is that pain from PMR or prednisone withdrawal? So I asked multiple rheumatologists this question because it's incredibly confusing. PMR makes you feel achy and miserable and prednisone withdrawal makes you feel achy and miserable. So when I asked the panel of rheumatologists, like these are the people whose names are on the articles that are published in the New England Journal of Medicine, Journal of American Medical Association. All of these like high profile, basically the most famous rheumatologists in the world, okay? I asked a panel of them and I said, how does a person know? How do you tell the difference? And they kind of all didn't either understand the question or dismissed it. They were confused. Like if the pain's coming back, it's PMR. It's as if they had never heard of prednisone withdrawal. And at first that surprised me here because I've been talking about prednisone for seven years and I thought, well, of course they would know about prednisone withdrawal. But when I first became the prednisone pharmacist, First of all, I'd never even heard of PMR. And second, I'd never heard of prednisone withdrawal <laughs> at that time. And so I was surprised when I discovered that prednisone withdrawal was a thing. The way these rheumatologists talked about it is, oh, that's just adrenal insufficiency. And I was like thinking to myself, no, it, it's not adrenal insufficiency. Like actually that's not what it is at all. But I wasn't going to correct them in, like while well, I'm standing at a microphone asking them for advice right? So then I talked to a few of them after individually. So one of them, I said, okay, so actually there were three of them. And I said, all right, steroid withdrawal, real or not real? That's what I asked. And they said, um, real, but I don't know if they'd ever heard that term before. Anyway, they said real, but it's just adrenal insufficiency. I was like, okay, so if somebody is going through alcohol withdrawal, is that alcohol insufficiency? Like, is it your body's inability to make alcohol? What about opioid withdrawal? If somebody's going through opioid withdrawal, like you're trying to go off pain medicine, is that an inability of your body to make opioids? Or what about benzodiazepine withdrawal? Is that an inability of your body to make benzodiazepines? And I, I wish I'd explained it as well as I just did because it, it didn't go that well. But I was trying to help them see the distinction between adrenal insufficiency being your brain turns off its signal from the hypothalamic pituitary and adrenal axis. That signal of hormones is turned off. Therefore, when you take prednisone, everybody becomes adrenal insufficient. And it's just a feature of taking more prednisone than your body makes in the equivalent of cortisol. And so if you were to test anybody on prednisone, they will show up as adrenal insufficient. <laughs> I don't think they got the distinction that when you're going through withdrawal, it's because your body suddenly got used to higher amounts of a substance, whether it's alcohol or opioids or benzodiazepines or prednisone. I'm not saying we're abusing prednisone. I'm saying our body has become dependent on it because it has, it has to have more receptors to use up the higher amount of the substance, right? And when you decrease from, say, 40 to 20 milligrams, that's a 50% decrease. And the corresponding number of receptors needs to drop by 50%. People don't usually notice prednisone withdrawal with that kind of a drop. What they do notice is when we're going from 20 to 10 or 10 to 5, that same 50%, people's bodies sometimes notice this withdrawal feeling. And so one rheumatologist I was talking to, he said, well, if they don't have like frank adrenal insufficiency, I think he, what he meant was adrenal crisis, such as hypotension, like low blood pressure, 
hypoglycemia, super low blood sugar, and hyponatremia, super low salt in your blood. If they don't have those three things, but are feeling yucky, he didn't use that word, <laughs> then it's something else. And I said, yeah, I think that's prednisone withdrawal or steroid withdrawal syndrome. And he said, hmm. It was as if he'd never heard of the term before. He never grasped that possibility as a reason people are feeling that way. And I said, but whether it is or isn't, would it change the way you treat the patient? Like clinically as a doctor, does it matter whether it's adrenal insufficiency or steroid withdrawal? Because ultimately I think it's probably the same outcome. And he said, well, if somebody is feeling yucky after decreasing prednisone, I wouldn't increase their dose. And I was like, what? I didn't say that though. I was like, oh. I would just say, get used to it. You're gonna feel yucky. So this was a young guy who's actually a fellow at Johns Hopkins. So he's young and not, you know, hasn't gotten tons of experience yet. So then I asked another guy and he is one of those big names on the publications. I said, so, hey, I, I asked this question yesterday, but I wanted to just follow up on this question and see what you thought. And I said, is there a difference between adrenal insufficiency and prednisone withdrawal? And you know, what do you do when your patient just feels yucky when they decrease dose, when they have no energy, when they have achy, miserable feelings, essentially it feels kind of like the flu. What do you do? And he said, well, if I let them go about a week and if it doesn't improve, then I tell them to go back up on their dose. And I thought, interesting. He said, it's probably not their PMR coming back. Like if they were having shoulder pain or hip pain, he called it trochanteric bursitis, then, you know, that would be the PMR coming back. But if it's not the PMR coming back, it's just other aches. Then he's like, he didn't really say, oh, it could be a steroid withdrawal syndrome. He just was like, I'd probably increase their dose. And one of the statements that was made yesterday was talking about steroids and how all the rheumatologists think, oh, I don't keep patients on it forever. I'm a good prescriber. I take care of my patients. And then a statistic was shown that 40% of people are taking prednisone long-term who shouldn't be taking it. Like for, oh, 40% of people with rheumatoid arthritis are on prednisone long-term. And how all the rheumatologists are like, well, that's not me, that's not me, that's not me. And he's like, but it is you. Like, I guarantee you have at least one, if not more than one patient that is on prednisone long-term. Maybe you didn't start the prednisone on them, but that you are on, like, they are on prednisone long-term. And how it's looked down upon because, you know, we all hate prednisone, but we also know how you've got to be on it to get the relief you need, or in my case, to save my life. So he was joking about that, how we all have that patient. And one of them, he can say, for example, came to him on five milligrams, had been on it for years and years. And he said, okay, let's try to go to four milligrams. And at four milligrams, they suddenly started feeling yucky, just achy and miserable. And he said, you know, I will try that six or seven times. And if it doesn't work, it doesn't work and they'll probably end up going back up to five milligrams. And I tried, like I tried to get them down. Was that because they had adrenal insufficiency and their body cannot make cortisol on its own? Or was it that they're going through prednisone withdrawal syndrome and their body is just so much slower at accommodating that withdrawal? And then he said, another option is that it's the placebo effect or nocebo effect that they know what to expect as far as withdrawals or whatever. And so they'll suddenly feel yucky, even though they wouldn't have otherwise felt yucky because they're, they're like, oh, I'm going from five to four. I'm going to feel awful again. Is it just in your head? I sure hope this information I'm sharing on my channel doesn't like lead people to be putting things in their head that shouldn't otherwise be there that the placebo effect isn't something I'm giving people essentially. I hope, I hope that's not a problem. But so that was an, another option is that it's in your head. I don't think for most people that it's just in your head. I think the way people describe it to me is it's horrific. Like it's not just, eh, I don't feel good. It's like, I literally cannot get off the bed. I am so disabled. Normally I'm fine on normal prednisone. I can get up, I can do my own dishes. Now I can't even get out of bed to get dressed. Like I can't do anything. 
And then the next thing he said was, yeah, and then I'll test them. And he described the ACTH stimulation test where they'll inject some substance into your veins and test every 30 minutes for like two hours to see if you make cortisol. And I thought it was fascinating that he's telling me that he will do this test on people currently taking prednisone because this is a really super gray area too. I've tried to read as much research about this as I can. And what I've discovered is that there's no value in testing a person's cortisol ability while they're taking prednisone. That any dose of prednisone is enough to turn down your body's system. Like I mentioned earlier, the HPA axis, and you won't be able to pass that test essentially. I know there are some people who can, who the test will show that they're making cortisol, but there's no, like the test is not very accurate. Like if you're making cortisol while on prednisone, will you continue to make cortisol while off prednisone? And there's no evidence that that's true. It's just not a well-studied area, but most of the research I've been able to find is that there's no point in testing cortisol until a person's been off of prednisone for three weeks. That until three weeks have passed, there's just too many factors that are not reflective of reality. So it was interesting to hear that he would do that. And he's like one of the most premier rheumatologists. And he's saying, yeah, I'll test their cortisol ability. And I could be wrong. I'm not an endocrinologist, but I've read a lot about this and I've never heard that it's a valuable test to do while taking prednisone. So I guess the takeaway here is that I was not alone in not knowing about steroid withdrawal syndrome. These premier rheumatologists don't know anything about it. Like I can't find anyone who does actually. (laughs) So this question of, is it the PMR flaring or is it my steroid withdrawal syndrome? I can't find anyone who can answer that question. So here's what I conclude about this experience here at Harvard Medical School, learning from the top premier rheumatologists of the world and how they've basically never really heard of, thought about, or considered steroid withdrawal syndrome to be what their patients are going through when they complain to them of feeling yucky after tapering, that they're either gaslighting them and thinking they're just making it up, it's just all in your head, or that it's adrenal insufficiency, which like chemically literally makes no sense. Or I don't know, like they're not too concerned about it that like they don't really consider that it's a real problem. And so either the researchers who've published about steroid withdrawal syndrome in legitimate medical journals are making it up or there's a serious lack of education about this phenomenon. And I don't know what to do about that because I'm just a pharmacist. I don't teach rheumatologists and they don't really know about it. I tried to get the fellow at Johns Hopkins to consider it. And like I said, how how could a person do research on this? And he said, I don't know. So it didn't seem like he was even really willing to think more about it. So it sounds like if anybody knows a research institution, like their rheumatologist or anybody like that who'd be willing to do a study on this, I think that would be amazing because we don't have information about it. We don't know, is it adrenal insufficiency? Is it steroid withdrawal syndrome? Or is it your disease flaring? We don't know that. Adrenal insufficiency doesn't make sense to me because it's an inability of your body to make cortisol. And that's 100%. Everybody gets that. Duh. That wouldn't be causing symptoms. Is it prednisone withdrawal? And if so, how do you know? And then how do you know if it's a flare of your disease? So those are some research questions I would like to have answered. But the ultimate outcome is some doctors are going to make you just suffer. Like the Johns Hopkins resident and this other doctor said, I will take them back up to the dose where they weren't suffering before. So each doctor is going to deal with it in a different way. And I personally believe on getting back to the lowest effective dose where you weren't having symptoms is the way to treat it. Would it be any different than the way they would treat adrenal insufficiency or adrenal crisis is what I think it really should be called. No, it's not. The the strategy would be to go back to the lowest effective dose where you weren't having symptoms. So... I don't know, I'm just trying to process the outcomes of this, that this is not appreciated by rheumatologists and there's no answer to this question that so many people have. But the way to deal with it is the same. 
I think, go back up to the lowest effective dose where you weren't feeling that yucky. I wish it was easier, but I think that's the way we've got to deal with it for now. If you find out better information, please let me know. If you have a rheumatologist who gets this, please send me their way. I would love to talk to them to understand their thinking. Signing off as Dr. Megan, your prednisone pharmacist.